Yes, welcome in. Badgers getting ready to head to the East Coast to take on Rutgers on Saturday. The kick coming at 11 a.m. We're going to get into that game. We're going to get into a little bit of uh, – we have a new backup quarterback to talk about. Is that right? I mean, obviously, we knew that Mabry Mattire was going to be the backup last week. We didn't get to – we got to see him in a game for the first time against Purdue. And uh, Jesse had a chance to talk with him, so we'll catch up uh, exactly how he's feeling now in his new role as Braden Lunk's uh, backup. But, yeah, get into the game. How do you stop Rutgers? Can Wisconsin continue or keep its uh, offensive momentum going from last week? And then we'll get into our week seven picks. Uh, before we do, as always, Home Field Apparel is the official apparel sponsor of the camp. Can't find better, better vintage gear in the college game then with home field, they have just a huge collection of new Wisconsin vintage gear up on their website, homefieldapparel.com. Go check it out and use the promo code Bucky24 for your uh, uh, for 15% off your first purchase. All right, let's uh, let's jump into this, Jesse. It is uh, Rutgers and Wisconsin coming up on Saturday, as I said. And I I look at this game and, and normally you're like Rutgers win. It's a little bit different this year, not just because of where Wisconsin's at, but because of what Rutgers has become under Greg Schiano for the second time. It's a, I think, uh, a, certainly a much tougher game than the last time they went to Piscataway, which I believe they won 52 to three. And uh, it was just a, a laugher throughout. I don't anticipate that on Saturday. So what does success look like for Wisconsin on Saturday? Other than well, just saying it just a win. Yes, in the broadest terms, you better rack up a W because it's going to be a long season if you don't, even though the Badgers aren't favored. I think if we start defensively, Kyle Manungai, Rutgers running back, is one of the best in the Big Ten. He's averaging over 130 yards per game. They've got to have a really stout run defense, and I'm sure the plan will be focused on stopping Manungai and making anybody else beat you. They have Ethan uh, Kalik. Kelly Manis, easy for me to say, the quarterback who is at Minnesota before. He's had a decent season so far. He's got eight touchdowns, three interceptions. But I think you've got to make sure you stop Manungai defensively. Um, and maybe there are some things they can build on from that Purdue game, the couple of goal line stands. Offensively, I don't expect 600 yards or 589 yards like we saw a week ago. But can you find some of those small details that they were able to succeed in? Can they get Tretch Kekahuna the ball? We had a chance to talk to Will Polling this week, which means he's healthy enough to be in that position. I think some people may have been worried, certainly when they saw him go down. Bryson Green was not one of those guys who was made available. So take that for what it is. That's We we talked to the players on Tuesday afternoon, and by then they're at least deep enough into their preparations to probably have a sense of where guys are going to be. But Braden Locke, can he get it rolling? Can you get to Wee Walker and Darian Dupree going? It's kind of the same stuff that we saw a week ago, but you better do it at a much higher level to win. Well, you just killed my next two segments, so I appreciate that. But just in terms of what I think uh, success looks like for the Badgers, certainly a, a win going out there and getting it because you look at the rest of the schedule, and we talked about this the other day, is if you don't win this one, where are your other wins to to get to, to bowl eligibility? Which I know people are like, that's such a low bar to hit but that's because it's been how many straight years? I think, was it 20, is it 23 now that they've... Uh, 22, I think it started 22. in 02, right? Because the 01 yep. team up Mary went five and seven. Um, and yeah, like it's not the highest of bars. They're trying to compete for the championships that uh, obviously they've discussed since they hired Luke at the same time. It's a big deal to, to keep, keep that streak going because if you're not at that level, then, um, you know... There's a lot of bowl games out there. So if you can't make a bowl, you're in you're in trouble. All right. And again, it's you have to get to, to six wins, or if you're desperate, you get to five and there's not enough bowl games or there's not enough bowl eligible teams to fill out all the bowls that there are. And then you get into a bowl game like Minnesota did last year. Um, but for Wisconsin, this would be win four. So you'd have to find two more the rest of the way, right? And I think that there are you know, Northwestern and, and Minnesota are games that are certainly winnable for Wisconsin the rest of the way. And I look at the other games that they have on their schedule. Two of those are at home against big time opponents in um, in Oregon and in Penn State. And then obviously you go to Iowa and you go to Nebraska. I think of of all those of those four games, say they don't win on Saturday. I'm not trying to be negative, just say they don't. Which of those four do you think they have the best chance of, of winning? 
I'd be inclined to say Iowa among the four, um, just because even though that's a road game, every time they play, it feels like it's a super close game. I know that Iowa's offense is improved, but I, I think that's just one of those games that's going to end up being a one possession game and kind of a coin flip. And the other one would be Nebraska. It's just that I know Wisconsin hasn't lost to Nebraska since 2012 when they went down to Lincoln. But this is a different Nebraska team. And so you can say, well, they haven't necessarily had to handle success or been a good team, but it's a completely the complexion of that program is completely different now than even a year ago because they've got a five star quarterback in Dylan Rayola. They've proven they can win some some games um, and obviously just beat Rutgers and showed they can win in a variety of ways, only gave up seven points. So I almost think the Iowa game is the more winnable of them based on what those two programs have shown. So not the two home games. No, I don't think so. Okay. I mean, look, I know there is something to be said for the home field advantage and the high likelihood at least one of those is going to be at night. But those are the kinds of opponents where you, I think, really see the difference between what does a true playoff contender look like and where Wisconsin is right now. So I'm, I'm not inclined to say that those would be in my top two among those four. I think this week could change my view. Okay. I think if they go out to Rutgers and handle Rutgers or, you know, win the game and they look good doing it and you get another solid performance offensively and, and all that good stuff, I think that could change my opinion on, on the games and potentially what they could do the rest of the year. If they lose, certainly it goes the other way, but like if they win and you, and you like what you see from it and Braden Locke has another solid game and they don't beat themselves and they force, you know, Rutgers into beating themselves like that. That is an opportunity for a change in how I, I think I view the rest of the season. I don't know if you would agree with that or not. I just feel like this has a chance to go up or, you know, like a chance to, to really shoot your season up, even though, again, I know it's Rutgers, but this isn't, you know, old Rutgers or this isn't uh, a few years ago. Rutgers this is a different Rutgers team. That's, that's tough and is going to battle you physically. We saw it in Madison last year. Obviously, it was a 10 nothing game right before half. It looked like Rutgers was going to go and score there. And then, um, you know, Ricardo Hallman happened and he returned the interception for the touchdown. But I, it's a tough game. I think it's a it's a tough game and it can give you an opportunity to see perhaps who Wisconsin truly is. Maybe they can get some momentum going. I don't think a win would change my perspective on the team per se. I mean, I just go back to what did I think about this team before the season that I, I thought they'd be seven and five. And really this is, this was one of those toss ups maybe even before the year, but it's looks more and more like that because of the way Rutgers has played. Um, I don't know that I would feel like some of those games are more winnable down the stretch, but you're right. It does. Every game depends on how they play and if they win by multiple scores and they hold them off handily and look like they're making progress, then you know, maybe there's more optimism about winning some of those games that don't seem as winnable right now. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about the game a little bit. You already mentioned uh common guy. They did a, a solid job, of, a solid job on him last year, but this is one of the better rushing teams in the big 10 and in the country right now. So I look at this group and be like, if Wisconsin that like it comes down to Wisconsin's line. We I think uh Ethan Kelly Commandus has maybe a different spot in some Wisconsin fans' heads because of what happened in 2022 uh, uh, when he came to Camp Randall and dropped 300 and some odd yards and a bunch of touchdowns in Minnesota's win in that game. But he's still um he's still Ethan Kelly Commandus. But I think it comes down to Kyle Manunga. Yeah, I would tend to agree. That's it's one of those guys. How many times can you get him the ball? Um, and it's sort of that old school Wisconsin mentality of you have someone that you believe can help to wear down the defense. And I know we've had questions consistently about the run defense, the Purdue game notwithstanding. So this is an opportunity to really bow up and scheme things up to stop him. Because I do think if, look, if they can hold him to half his yardage average, 65 yards or something, I don't know. I don't see how Rutgers wins i don't see the path forward where you are putting it on your quarterback and your wide receivers when you have a tailback who is that good so it absolutely has to start with figuring out how to stop him and maybe they can take something again from the purdue game where you had some different playmakers step up and perform well on saturday yeah i mean i again i just have a a question about wisconsin's run defense still i know that it didn't really happen last last week 
though. I thought Purdue, especially on the edges early in that game, had some success. I still I, that's kind of where my question remains with Wisconsin's defense. I think they're going to be <clears throat> completely fine pass game wise, um, but stopping the run, especially against a power team that's going to run it at you and and do it in ways that um, I don't think that they've seen this year, to be honest with you. And I mean, Alabama to an extent, but like this is a team that's going to wants to beat you up in the trenches. And so I'm a little I'm a little wary of whether they're going to be able to do it. I think that's a huge key. And you're right. If they stop that, I don't think that they are uh, with uh, Rutgers offense passing game wise is good enough to beat Wisconsin. So that's the way it feels. Yeah. So we'll we'll uh, we'll have to keep an eye on that, obviously. But I think there are some people that think of uh, Ethan Kelly Comanis in a different way, just simply because of what he did in 22. But then you go back and look at last year and, you know, Wisconsin's uh, against Minnesota knocked him out of the game. I mean, they uh, got a hit late in that game that knocked him out uh, after his interception uh, that Ricardo Hallman had there on the sideline in a game that Wisconsin largely dominated after the first few drives from Minnesota. So uh, building on the success for Wisconsin's offense, Rutgers defense is stout. We saw that last week against Nebraska. I, one one thing about Nebraska, they are like they're back to playing defense the way that they used to play when the black shirts actually meant something. You know what I mean? Like that, we they're a much better defensive team now than they were uh, a few years ago, and I think that's kind of leading their 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 team. It hasn't been offensively. I I think Dylan Royola has is a fantastic player and is going to be and is the type of quarterback you want to build a program around. But he's not yet there. But their defense has been so good. That said, I think Wisconsin's offense against uh, against Rutgers can they build on what they do? And I know you mentioned Will Pauling, but to me it's Tretch Kekahuna, it's Tywee Walker, it's Dylan Dupree, and can they get those guys the ball more? And maybe Vinny Anthony, too, because when Vinny Anthony's had the ball in his hands the last two weeks, he's made things happen. Yeah, if we just want to start with the run game, I'd be interested to see what the the ratio of carries is, because if we look at last week, Tywee Walker ended up with 19 carries, very clearly the number one, and then Darian Dupree had seven carries. Now, maybe the ratio would have been different if it was a closer game because obviously the last couple drives, they got some young guys in there. We saw Cade Iacomelli score a touchdown. Dylan Jones broke off a 47-yard run. Um, but is it is the plan moving forward to we – this is your game. You're going to get 18 to 20 carries every game or something in that realm. And how many are there left for Darian Dupree? I think, I think that'll be something that's interesting because we know obviously Luke wants to pare down this – running back rotation and then how many would be left for a Cade Iacomelli because I don't think they can fully leave him out he's done too much to not be included but in the past game you've got to figure out a way to build on what what Tretch was able to do the six catches for 134 yards they targeted him nine times I know I mentioned on the last show they had only targeted him 10 times through the first four games you see what he's capable of doing so can you scheme some things up where you get him the ball and also if Will Pauling is healthy do you have more situations where you put both of them on the field um, and, and, or do you not because Rutgers is a, is a pretty solid defensive team. And do you want to have more of that physical style of play that we saw earlier in the season? I think those are questions that obviously have got to figure out because what's going to give Wisconsin the best matchup in a game like this. Yeah, <clears throat> I would agree. The The thing about Rutgers defense is it is a, a solid unit. No doubt. They have shown a little bit, of uh, an ability to run the ball against them. Now, that was not the case against Nebraska. Uh, and they've also, you know, some of the some of the quarterback run game has uh, has gotten them, but they've given up. They're, they're like 85th in the country. They held Nebraska to 2.7 yards per carry. But before that, they had gotten absolutely um, torched. Washington, 7.1. Virginia Tech, 6.8 yards per carry. Akron, 6.2. Even Howard in that opener where they lost 44-7 to uh, averaged four yards a carry. So do you focus on, I think that has to be, um, at least in Wisconsin's mind, or does Rucker sell out and, you know, um, force Braden Locke to do what he did last week? If that's the case, can he do it? Well, I guess it's a good week to find out because he finally showed that he has a, a little bit higher ceiling, at least in some matchups, because he's just been a 50 percent quarterback for his for his whole career. Um, I don't know. I don't know the answer. I mean, I think I think he's got um, a pretty steely resolve, like the Illinois game last year. Again, the sample size is growing, but it's not massive. He's got five starts um, when they are 
faced with adverse situations, he seems to be the same quarterback and that stuff matters. But I do wonder whether they're going to go to what they did earlier in the season and, and say, okay, this is one of the, this is why we did what we did early in the season. Cause Luke kind of alluded to that when we get into those big 10 games and you're going to have to show that you can be the, this type of team. Uh, but like we've said before, it's never going to be a 40 run 20 pass type of team. So they're going to have to be able to do both. And, and even if it's not, a 69 yarder to Tretch or 250 plus yarders like he's had to Vinny Anthony the last two weeks, you're going to have to be able to stretch the field to some degree uh, because I don't think they can just pound the rock and have no passing game, obviously. And I think they're going to be able to, I, I, again, I, I think they saw last week that they have that ability and it's, uh, I was talking with somebody earlier this week and the, the game last week was a great, you know, way to show, as you said, the ceiling for perhaps, uh, a higher ceiling for Braden Locke and for the offense itself, but you can't say that's who they are. Right. Right. But this week has an opportunity to show that's who they can be. And, or um, uh, this week has an opportunity for them to show who they are. Right. Like that, they, if they do it for a second straight week, you could sit there and say that is who they are. I think the best way to put it is it is a much more representative barometer on the state of this program both offensively and defensively, because it's one thing to beat up on maybe the worst power four team, certainly a team that's in the running in that conversation. And another thing to do it against a team that's what four and one that is favored in this game where you go on the road and you're going to have to play really good football. Like how many games can we say in the Luke Fickle era that they put together four really good quarters where if you were a fan, you felt good about the direction things were headed a week ago. Right. Beyond that, not too many games. And so this is one of those opportunities to show, all right, you, you Luke wants to talk about the baby steps that he feels like they're making. This is a big game to show that uh, they've not only made baby steps, but can do a little bit more and give you some momentum and optimism for what the future could be. Cause like, it's not going to be this year. I don't think based on the schedule. I mean, they're not suddenly going to vault into college football playoff contention, or they're a top 20 team and they're just on the outside and you have that hope. But if you start winning games like this, getting back to winning the games that Wisconsin for so long just consistently won, that's the starting point on building this program into the next level. Yeah, I I agree. They it's another opportunity to to show that they have made improvement, and we'll see if they're able to do it. Uh, I think again, I think it comes down to their ability to run the ball and their ability to stop the run. If they could run the ball like some teams have done against uh, Rutgers, I think they're going to have a very good chance to have a really good offensive game because I think they'll be able to mix in some of the stuff we saw last week in the past game. And then if you can stop Nungai and put it all on uh, Cal Kamanis, feel good about that. So we'll see if they're able to do it. I, it it's a, it is a, it's going to be a test. It's going to be a test. The one thing that I don't think anybody wants to see, well, I shouldn't say anybody. I'm sure there are some out there that want to see it. Um, uh, I don't think anybody, I don't think a lot of people want to see the backup quarterback on Saturday. However, Mabry Retire is now a snap away from being in the game. We got to see him last week a little bit, run the offense for a couple of drives, and you had a chance to talk with him this week. You put the, um, your story up earlier this morning on exactly his, uh, his route to where he's at right now and, and how he's gotten there. And for you, what is, what stood out about that? And what, what, uh, what did you focus on in that story? The biggest thing is the intellectual growth as a quarterback, and this happens pretty frequently with a true freshman quarterback, but Mabry is a classic example of this. When I was talking to him about the the knowledge that he's acquired since he got here in January, when he was in high school at the Woodlands High School in Texas, they played a shotgun spread system, which is no surprise. And he said he had a a basic understanding of defensive coverages. Like he, he knew what they were in, but didn't necessarily have that advanced understanding of some of the subtle tweaks or adjustments that somebody might make. He didn't have to have that understanding when you're the best player out there, when you have the best arm, you're the best athlete, you can just out athlete teams. And so he would fling the ball down the field with great success. He ended up throwing 88 touchdowns in high school. And I go back to like Graham Mertz too. You watched his film in Kansas. Now the high school football in Kansas is not as good clearly as it is in Texas, but those really high level quarterbacks, they could just stand back there, throw it, do whatever they wanted. Well, you better be a lot better from uh, an understanding of football standpoint when you get to college. And I think that's one of the things where he's developed the most. And he's kind of drinking th- the phrase would be cliched as it is drinking through the fire hose because these last four weeks, he went from being a number three where he said, especially when they broke camp, 
and they started the game week preparations, he's not getting any reps. There's not enough for the number three. There's obviously you've got Tyler Van Dyke, and then the twos go with with Braden Locke, and Mabry's not the scout team quarterback, so it's the mental reps. He said he's not that kind of a quarterback. Like obviously he's trying to learn, but he does best when he has an opportunity to be hands on, and so. Now he's got that chance. And he said that the ratio of snaps, I thought was it was interesting. Is he, he called it like 60-40, if not 55-45 in terms of how they're split up. He said the only thing he doesn't do that the ones do is like the last 10 minutes of a game week practice, whatever that may be. Maybe it's a, a real life game type situation. I don't know. But uh, so he's getting all of that experience. And I thought CJ Williams gave a good answer about some of the growth that he's seen from Mabry because CJ occasionally he'll sit in on the quarterback meetings just so he can understand what they're talking about, how he can mesh with those guys well. And he said early on, Mabry would be in the room and Phil Longo would be asking questions and Mabry wouldn't necessarily have the answer. And now he's very quick with the answer. Maybe not as quick as Braden Locke, which is understandable, but he understands the concepts. And when he goes out to practice, he can translate them because CJ said early on, Maybe would he knew like one RPO look, he would run the same thing uh, every time. And now he knows what to do in different situations, whether it's a cover two, cover three defense, whatever it is the defense is presenting. So I think that is the the biggest thing, the biggest takeaway about his growth since he came here as an early enrollee is just the understanding of defensive coverages. Cause I mean, Phil's what's his message been all along? Knowledge equals reps. Uh, you better have the knowledge if you're going to get the reps. And so now he's acquiring that. Yeah, Nick Evers knows all about that. There you go. Yeah. yeah. And and that's another part of the, the trajectory here, too, is they know that they've got a talented quarterback in Mabry and they want to get him opportunities. In the spring, he was splitting snaps basically with Nick Evers, though it was very clearly trending toward Mabry. And then Nick left. And Mabry took over as a full-time number three. But Luke talked about this on multiple occasions, even in that the last scrimmage that they had at UW Platteville, they wanted to get Mabry some reps with the twos. And it just, the way the scrimmage happened, he didn't end up getting any two reps. It was, I think Tyler ended up with eight, eight series with the first team offense because by then they figured out their one and two. Braden had seven with the second team offense. And then Mabry had four with the third team offense. But like, there's only so much you can show the coaching staff with that third team offense, just being real about it. Cause it's either walk-ons or young guys that don't know all the plays. And Luke even said this week, he didn't want Mabry to be calling all these checks and stuff. Cause you just want the play to function. So um, they were trying to figure out how do we get him reps to actually evaluate him? And I think that was a challenge early on, but now he's got no choice. So based on what you saw in fall camp though, how would you assess Mabry in being ready to go? And again, I know it was third team reps, but just like, his play, his throws, his decision making. Like, how would you assess that? And I know, again, it's been almost two months since we've seen a practice. Yeah. Well, at the time, uh, not ready, uh, which we talked about in the preseason that there was there was Tyler and Braden, and then a, a very clear drop off to Mabry, which is completely understandable because Tyler's fifth year senior. Uh, Mabry um, or Braden's in his third year, and he's already got a year in the system. But I think there were some good things that you saw. And I also think the things we've heard from Luke and Phil and some of the players that it seems like there's a huge difference here in the last month. And a lot of that comes with the opportunity. I don't think he's an entirely different quarterback and you can't change the lack of experience. But like I think of what he was able to do as a as a runner early on, especially when they put Darian Dupree in there. Um, you had to pay attention to Darian. And he he I think maybe did a really good job of being able to pull the ball and gain chunks of yardage. As a passer, I think it was inconsistent, which is understandable. I mean, I think I've said this before. I think of a play. Maybe it was it was certainly late in the spring and maybe it, or, or in the fall at the Camp Randall Stadium where he kind of threw this uh, route to the sideline. And just like, I don't know if that was his first read, just kind of stared him down and the DB picked it off and ran it back for a touchdown. And so I, I obviously Wisconsin doesn't want to have to use him, um, but that's the spot they're in. It is. And I do you. This is unfair, but do you see his future? Like, what what do you see his future as? I know it's early, it's and it's and it's unfair. But what do you see his future as? Well, it's tough because I, I think I have a at this point, it's hard to see how he could overtake Braden as long as Braden is here. Just because how much have we heard about the the knowledge and and all of those things, and the more starts Braden gets. 
I think you get further and further away from him because he's getting all the experience and you're not. And I think it's really difficult to just say, oh, well, we think this younger guy might have a higher ceiling, uh, though he hasn't proven it and maybe doesn't have the full comprehension of the offense. And so I'm that's why I think I have a hard time seeing the path for Mabry to jump Braden. On the other hand, he's two classes younger. He's going to redshirt this season. And sometimes you wait your turn if you're willing to do so, and you get a couple seasons to be the starter. And obviously sometimes someone gets hurt and now you're the guy. So I don't, I don't think, I mean, I think he's certainly in the future plans here. And when you consider the rest of the quarterback room as it's currently constructed, um, absolutely. He'd be, you know, next in line. We also know this is the time of always moving, right? Like if, if, if Braden Locke shows he's the guy, over these next few games or the next few weeks or the next, the rest of the season, there's so much that can change, right? Fair, yeah. Uh, well, of course. I mean, what, what is Tyler Van Dyke's future? Is there another year for him here? Um, and if there is, what would Braden decide to do? Obviously his younger brother Landon is committed, but is coming off a torn ACL. What's Cole Cruz future here. He's, he's dealt with injuries. We haven't seen him at all. It's, frankly hard to see what the path forward would be for him especially if you're not getting any reps at all how can you acquire the uh you know knowledge equals reps um I, I just i don't know what what the path forward would be for him and when you've only got four scholarship quarterbacks or five scholarship quarterbacks and someone leaves then you might go to the portal to fill it did phil even mention cole the other day or was did he he brought up the walk-on instead of <laughs> yeah well yeah he made he made a point to say at the end of his answer um which started with a uh, commentary on Braden, even though I was asking about Mabry, it was a way to say how far Braden is out in front with his knowledge that Milos, the walk-on quarterback had done a really nice job as the scout team quarterback. And I would say, I don't know what Cole's role is get since again, we haven't seen much, but we saw very little of him in camp as well. All right, let's get into our week seven picks. You had a very good week. You went six and one. You're now 25, six, uh, 25, 16 and one on the year. I'm 21, 20 and one because I uh, trailed most of your picks. So it worked out pretty well for me, um, but it is a huge weekend. It, it would have been a much bigger weekend if certain things had not happened last week, like USC losing to Minnesota and, you know, um, some of the other things that, that went down, but still a ton of really fun games this week. A lot of uh, big time games. We'll start down in Dallas. Uh, the Cotton, they're playing at the Cotton Bowl. Number one, Texas, taking on number 18, Oklahoma. And the Longhorns are 14 and a half point favorites in that game. Well, based on my thought process a week ago, these big numbers scare me and taking the team to cover. Um, I know Texas has been awesome. This just is one of those rivalry games that strikes me as something that's going to go down to the wire and i, I feel like oklahoma is going to cover i think texas will win i also wonder I mean, texas is going to play georgia next week that is just a, a huge game and not that they would ever look ahead because this is such a huge rivalry but i just think oklahoma is going to put it together enough to keep this close quinn ears ears expected to return for this this game for texas uh, bumping arch manning back to the bench he reportedly is 100 percent I don't know. We'll, we'll see if uh, that ends up being the case, but I'm going to go with Oklahoma as well in this one. Uh, LSU and Ole Miss. Ole Miss coming off. Was that was that last week or the week before that they lost to Kentucky? Uh, I think it was, it was a couple weeks ago. Yeah, lost uh, to Kentucky. They're ranked ninth in the country. LSU comes in 13th. Ole Miss is a three and a half point favorite on the road at LSU. I just think that's such a hard place to play that that's got to be worth a couple points. And I know LSU lost that opener to USC, which kind of put the Trojans into the, the top 15. Certainly have not played like it lately, but LSU's won every game since then. And so I think LSU's going to cover, if not win outright. LSU's defense is horrible. Like it's, it, it, it's not on the level of how bad it was last year, but it's, it's not great. And so I think uh, Ole Miss is going to put up some points, but it's a 630 game in Baton Rouge. Yeah, you get right. I mean, give me it's the LSU. hardest place to play, arguably in the country. 
According to EA College Football, it is the hardest play, pay, place to play in the country. Um, a not-so-tough place to play. You, actually, I, I haven't been there. You can disagree with me here if you want to. But Penn State's going on the road. Penn State up to number four. They're four-and-a-half point favorites at USC playing in the Coliseum. Is the Coliseum a tough place to play, Jesse? Well, first, did you end up picking o Ole Miss or LSU? I went with uh, L LSU as well. Okay. I think that's. I think that's. I thought that's what I said. All right. Um, is it a tough place to play? It's whatever. I don't know how. I mean, it's a historic venue, but it's no, just another it's football stadium. So, and I, I, there's going to be so many Penn State fans there too. Like it's it, just like it was with Wisconsin. There's just going to be. When teams are going out to USC or to UCLA for the first time in this environment, there's going to be so many visiting fans there. Mm -hmm. Not to mention a ton of people that <laughs> are from Pennsylvania or are from Wisconsin or are from the Midwest live in California now. And so it's just one of those places to easily get to. Yes. You know, USC doesn't have worse athletes now than they did a couple weeks ago when they outscored Wisconsin 28 to nothing. But all of a sudden, I'm questioning everything about the program that you go to Minnesota and you lose. And obviously, they lost to Michigan a couple weeks earlier. Big Ten's just a different animal. It just is with the physicality, with the way it can wear you down. And I think Penn State goes in there and covers and uh, shows why they're a legit college football playoff team and will still be undefeated by the time they get to Wisconsin here in a couple weeks. So I don't know if you saw this. I, 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 I'll give credit to, to, to Colton Bartholomew, but I think they're, it's been talked about a little bit um, but uh, since I'm looking at his tweet here, was uh, Big Ten games, Big Ten teams crossing two to three time zones, one yeah. in seven, one yeah. in seven this year. Does that give you pause at all? Maybe a little, but uh, I don't. I mean, I don't know how to explain that. It's not like these teams didn't travel before, um, and I guess it would be three time zones for Penn State going from East Coast to West Coast, but. I still think the better football team is is going to show itself in this particular matchup. Yeah, I mean, I, I, if you look at the games, I would suggest only, I mean, two of them would be considered upsets. I, I, I'm not, you know, right? Like Michigan at Washington last week and UC, USC at Minnesota would be the two games that I would look at and say, those are, those are true upsets, right? Yeah, the, it's not like Ohio State has gone to play UCLA. Like, let's let's get the really good teams going to play the crappy team. <laughs> right, right. Like, it, you know, Indiana at UCLA, that, not an upset. Northwestern losing at Washington, not an upset. Wisconsin was double-digit underdog against uh, against USC when they went out there. So it's not like it's, you know, this week is, I think, is, gonna, is a much better indication, right? You have your best teams, Penn State and Ohio State, on the road, or two of your best teams, going what going uh going to the west coast and so jumping a bunch of time zones and we'll see if that holds up but um i'm gonna take uh, i'm gonna take penn state as well uh yeah i'm gonna take penn state to uh, to cover that one all right kansas state going to colorado the wildcats four and a half point favorites colorado has uh some people believe it again in dion and everything that they're doing yeah, they're four and one, I think, right now. Um, I'm inclined to pick Kansas State. I don't know how much I trust Colorado right now in a matchup against a really good team. Um, I'd say what they played Nebraska, they lost to Nebraska. Um, and so I, I I think the Wildcats are gonna win. I think that's this this is a situation where uh Colorado has been given a lot of like everyone changed their tune about Colorado when they beat UCF the other the, a couple weeks ago. UCF isn't any good. They went and got smacked again this past weekend too. Like they're not a good team. Uh, I know they were ranked in the moment, but it, they're, they're not. So uh, that said, another sellout at Colorado. I'm going to take. Uh, I, I need to jump back into this somehow. So I'm going to take Colorado there and uh, at home because they get they're getting four and a half. So yeah, I'll take Colorado at home. The other uh, another game in the Big Ten: Washington traveling to Iowa. The Hawkeyes just three point favorites in that one. This is one of those where I, I think about these former Pac-12 teams having to do this weekly grind and how much of a toll does it take on you. Washington beat Michigan, um, and Michigan may not be that great of a football team, but 
I think I was going to win this game and cover. I know they just got housed at Ohio State, but I think a lot of teams would get housed at Ohio State. So I think the Hawkeyes win at uh, at Kinnick. I would agree. I'm going to go with I'm going to go with Iowa as well. This is a situation you look at at USC, right? They go to Michigan, come back home, go to Minnesota, and it it wear. I think it wears on them. I I have no I I just fully believe that. And again, you know, we'll see how it how it plays out. But I just I really think traveling a bunch of different time zones, traveling a bunch of different places and having to like do that trip every weekend. I think it can wear on you. Um, that said, I'm going to go Iowa as well. All right. Uh, number two, Ohio state at number three, Oregon, the game of the week, Buckeyes three point favorites uh, on the road at Oregon. What a game that would be to be at. Um, people have been circling this since before this season. I just look at the way both these teams have played to date. And I know they're both unbeaten, but Ohio State is unbeaten on a different level where they are just annihilating teams, whereas Oregon has been in some games that you'd think they maybe shouldn't be in. Uh, the outs in situation is kind of what scares me in making this pick just because, like, it's going to be totally insane. But I think Ohio State just has the better team. And so I think that they're going to go in there, win, and cover. They do have the better team. Autzen can can at times be an equalizer or certainly an advantage for Oregon as well. But getting three at home, I don't – yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to go with Oregon at home and uh, just hope that uh, Autzen and Dylan Gabriel and company can – can get it done. Um, and then the, the, obviously the huge, the, the biggest matchup of the weekend is in Piscataway, New Jersey, Wisconsin at Rutgers, the Scarlet Knights, two and a half point favorites. I won't bring up the trivia that I gave you earlier this week. Cause you seem very, uh, uninterested in it. So I'm not going to bring it up again, but, uh, yeah, Rutgers, a two and a half point favorite, uh, for an 11 AM kick. Okay, I think Wisconsin gets it done here. And if I'm going to say before the year that they're going to go seven and five, they darn well better win this one. Um, look, maybe they found something against Purdue. They've got to play better football, and they can't possibly just keep playing the way they have early in the season, I feel like. So if you want to make some strides, this is the game to show that you're actually doing it. Who is the player we're talking about after the game that made made the difference? That is a very good question. Um I will say, I'll say to Wee Walker. I mean, okay. he's coming off a three touchdown game. And again, I think based on what we saw a week ago, it seems to me very clear that he's going to be an 18 to 20 carry type of guy. Um, Cause he's the number one. And I, I mean, they, I don't think they want to put that on Darian to make it a 50, 50 split. So um, this is the type of game where they've got to show that sort of physical identity that Luke wants. So put it on the O-line, which Luke has talked about basically every week and give the ball to Walker and see what he can do. Uh, this might just be uh, a hope, just because I want to continue to see the ball in his hands, but Tretch, yeah. right? And and it's not just passing. We saw that last week, and it can involve the offensive line with some of the runs, some of the jet, the, the, the jet stuff that they were doing, the motion stuff that they are doing. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Get the ball in your best playmaker's hands, and he is definitely one of them, and they need to do that, I think, uh, to have success as an offense moving forward. I'm going to give, I'm going to go with Wisconsin as well in this one. Uh, they have not lost Rutgers since they got in the conference and uh, it doesn't start Saturday. So we'll see Jesse. Thank you very much. Thanks Zach. All right. There is Jesse temple from the athletic. You've been listening to the camp.